Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome uh, to Arab Center, uh, Washington. Uh, today's uh, topic for our uh, webinar is the prospects for developing an effective vaccine for COVID-19. When uh, and, and how? Uh, our uh, program today is typical, like our previous uh, programs. It will be a presentation and a short conversation uh, with our uh, guest uh, presenter and then followed by Q&A uh, for you to interact with our uh, speaker and present your uh, questions. You may use, if you are on Zoom, uh, the Q&A uh, part of the page there at the bottom of the page uh, to send your question. Please identify yourself, affiliation if you would like, and, and uh, state your question uh, short and sweet so we can uh, get to it uh, quickly and give our guest uh, an opportunity uh, to respond uh, directly uh, to you. You may also use uh, email if you are watching us on uh, Arab Center Washington uh, website, use the email uh, part of that and uh, th that will also appear on my screen here and I would be more than delighted uh, to re read your question, refer to you uh, by name and, and uh, get you uh, an answer. Uh, by way of introduction, let me say that uh, as we speak today, the COVID-19 pandemic is still threatening, uh, spreading, uh, despite uh, frantic attempts uh, by uh, so many governments right now uh, to deal with it, to, to even uh, pass that uh, first stage, if you will, by reopening and resuming what people refer to as normalcy, but <laughs> frankly, nobody knows what normal is, so let's uh, refer to it as new, the new normal uh, that we might uh, be facing uh, down the, uh, the road. The numbers this morning do not look encouraging. I just, before we started, uh, looked at the uh, uh, pandemic numbers globally. Uh, the cases have exceeded already 5.1 uh, million uh, with 330,000 deaths uh, worldwide. Uh, U.S. cases have exceeded uh, or approaching uh, 1.6 million uh, as we speak, uh, with uh, about uh, close to 95,000 uh, deaths uh, approximately over the past 24 hours. I would say at least 2,000 uh, deaths have happened in this country. For those who are interested specifically in the Arab world, uh, the numbers uh, this morning look like they are approaching uh, 200,000 cases. Uh, Arab worldwide, uh, with about uh, 2,500 uh, deaths uh, th thus far. Uh, some countries uh, are facing uh, or, or seem to be having a large, uh, basically, expansion in the or addition in terms of the numbers themselves. Uh, for example, uh, Saudi Arabia this, uh, this morning reported almost 2,500 cases over the past 24 hours uh, or so. Uh, uh, bringing it uh, closer to like 60,000 uh, total, uh, about 1,500 cases added over the past 24 hours in Qatar and, and, and so on. So uh, this continuing threat uh, has clearly, as you have been uh, aware, uh, unleashed a frantic uh, race for a vaccine. Uh, scientists uh, have expressed uh, somewhat, I would say, cautious uh, hope, uh, some a uh, little bit of optimism that a safe and effective vaccine can be produced uh, in record time. The question is, what is a record time? How quickly can we really uh, speed up a, a dangerous process uh, like that? So the debate is continuing. It's actually heating up as to, to whether that's doable. Uh, when some countries like the US is talking about uh, two or three months, uh, showing some uh, tangible results and beginning to produce a vaccine commercially before the end of the year and talking about even millions uh, of shots uh, available uh, by January. Uh, uh, people are again uh, going back to the old uh, habit of, of saying that we will have a treatment uh, by January that will be available to at least uh, 300 million if we need be if needs be to uh, all American citizens by then. Whether that's realistic or not is really the subject kind of, uh, of our uh, discussion uh, uh, today. Uh, as laymen, uh, you and I uh, uh, 
and people worldwide uh, in general are somewhat confused by the daily flow of information because that information uh, clearly is a mix of fact and fiction. And it's very difficult for the non-initiated, for the non-scientist, if you will, uh, to, to distinguish between uh, the two, particularly when the issue has been confused with politics. There is so much politics injected into the science at this point, it's hard to distinguish between the two. Uh, we're all aware that the U.S. government has declared uh, what they call Operation Warp Speed uh, to speed up the process because we know that a research for a vaccine of this magnitude, for a pandemic of this magnitude, uh, will take usually years, uh, sometimes even a decade or even more. Uh, so the, the administration is politically anxious, I think, uh, to show some progress for mostly political reasons. Is this doable scien scientifically? So we have a lot of questions that, that uh, you know, continue to be asked by the media and by scientists all over the world. And today, to, to help us sift through all that confusion, fact and fiction, uh, we are very uh, delighted to have a practitioner, uh, a man who specializes uh, in, in, in this uh, topic. And uh, Dr. Ali uh, Fatoum, uh, as indicated in the uh, bio that we have circulated to those of you who registered uh, for this uh, is Senior Vice Pre President of Vaccines Research and Development uh, at Blue Willow Biologics and has uh, uh, 25 years of experience in vaccine research and development. He is also adjunct professor uh, at the University of Michigan Nanotechnology Institute for Medicine and Biological uh, Sciences. Uh, he initiated uh, his uh, career in, in, in our area here as a vaccinologist at the National Institutes of Health in the Washington, D.C. area, where he helped develop several vaccines, uh, including, I hope I don't butcher the terms here, uh, pneumococcus and uh, conjugate vaccine, and headed the effort to develop vaccine for uh, S. aureus. Uh, he later joined Univax Biologics to pursue the development of conjugate vaccines, uh, against bacterial infection, including uh, staph lococci. Following the merger between Univax and North American Bi Biolog Biologics to, to form uh, NABI uh, Biopharmaceuticals, Dr. Fatoum assumed responsibility for other research activities and served as vice, vice president for research between 2003 and 2010. He has a BS degree from the Hebrew University in <coughs> Jerusalem and uh, an MS in microbiology from Tel Aviv University, and a PhD in micro, uh, microbial ecology at, uh, from the Hebrew uh, University in Jerusalem. Uh, from 1983 to 1986, uh, uh, Dr. Fatoum uh, taught at Birzeit University in uh, the West Bank of Palestine, and he is the author of uh, over 50 peer-reviewed publications and holds more than 10 patents uh, uh, in his uh, field. So Dr. Ali, welcome to Arab Center, and uh, we look forward to your presentation. Uh, you have about 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, I know you have some valuable slides to share with our audience, uh, and then we'll use the rest of the balance of our time for Q&A. Uh, welcome again, the microphone is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Khalil, I appreciate the invitation. And it's a pleasure to talk to you and uh, also to share some data and uh, some information about where we at, where we're going, and uh, how fast we are going to get there. So I'll have an introduction on the viral infections in general, and we'll talk about uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 versus the old SARS, whether where they come from and whether they are brothers or twins and so forth. Then we'll talk about the timeline of the disease, how this disease progressed from the uh, time zero until uh, fatality or uh, convalescence and recovery. And also we'll talk about the vaccines as intervention to prevent the infection. And we'll talk about the different uh, uh, technologies and the different companies and uh, how they approach the vaccine development. Uh, I'll also talk about the vaccinology concern. So when you talk about more than 100 uh, candidate vaccines and the uh, light speed by which uh, people are running, then you are asking yourself, really, are there any concerns? What are these concerns, especially in the background 
of what we have seen so far from uh, 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 presenting some data from uh, one of the companies. And then we'll talk, uh, I'll touch upon some of uh, our uh, technology from the University of Michigan and Blue Willow and what we do uh, as a vaccine and why we think that we are unique in this field. And then uh, I'll uh, uh, comment on some of the data that was presented lately and then uh, our target vaccines, and then we'll open it for questions and, uh, questions and, uh, and answers. So the first slide is for those who uh, uh, forgot or never seen a, a, a infection with viruses. So viruses are particles that have to use a living cell in order to be able to propagate and to uh, uh, make more. So they cannot divide and propagate by themselves. So they have to attack a cell and then they enter, uh, they enter the cells. All they have, these particles, is, uh, is DNA or RNA. And uh, they will get into the nucleus and they take over the cell. So the cell now is enslaved for the virus and start producing materials that are component of the virus. When they have enough, the, uh, uh, many viruses will be already assembled in the cell and start to uh, uh, get out of the cell. And this process of infection will cause all the inflammation, will cause some of those cells to go into a program death and to burst. And uh, the immune system will uh, try to get in and try to uh, uh, protect uh, against this. So this is the kind of the timelines. So the major point here is really the entrance of the virus into the, into the cell. And to do that, the virus has to attach to the cell. And then it will invade into the cell and start occupying uh, the cell and enslave it. Now to the COVID-19 and the coronaviruses. Coronaviruses are not new. We have coronaviruses as a regular cold uh, 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 infection. But the uh, 2002, 2003, there was the SARS-CoV, and that at that time, we thought or we know that the virus went uh, came from uh, uh, bats and through a palm civet cats, and then adapted and then jumped into humans and started the epidemic at the time which really caused a, uh, uh, deaths and infections, and, uh, but stayed at the level of uh, epidemic, meaning is in some areas, not across the world. While in the COVID-19, which was uh, a, a started in, in December 2019, it's the new one which is causing uh, the, uh, the, the, epidem the pandemic because it started to spread very fast across the world. And they are both uh, 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 similar. So if you look at the structure, you look at the, uh, the way they do it, they, where they bind to the cells. So if, we, if you look at the cell, you have these crowns, these crowns, the end of the crowns, binds to the AC, ACE2 receptor on the cells. So they both bind to the same receptor. So they are, not, they are uh, very close to each other, almost homologous. But when you look at the, <clears throat> the relationship between these two, and we're looking at the binding site, we see that there is a 74% sequence identity. And if you look at the total genome, the total RNA, there is about 80 to 90% homology between the old SARS and the new SARS. So they are not uh, uh, um, uh, twins, but they are either cousins or uh, uh, non-twin brothers. So that homology tells us that they came from the same place, but this one is more developed. And if you look at the binding uh, of the virus to the cells, you can see that the black, uh, the black uh, uh, dots here is the new SARS, the COVID-19, and the red one is the old one. You can see, uh, for those that don't, don't really uh, focus on the details, the COVID-19 binds 10 times faster and uh, stronger to the cells compared to the old SARS. And that's because of those differences that happened at the binding site on that crown. So that change in the crown adapted the cells, adapted the virus, 
to be able to attack the cell fast and become more fit into uh, uh, spreading. Now, we always ask ourselves, is this is coming from the wet market and so forth? This is the infections up to January 20th, about 460, uh, 25 uh, confirmed cases. And what you can see is that early on, most of the cases were in the wet market in the, uh, between December up to January, early January. But after January, we are seeing, seeing that many of the cases that we are diagnosing actually came person to person which is really uh, amazing that how a virus can just go through adapting itself, get more fitness and get more selection toward more virulence, and now is jumping from one person to one person. That's the red flag that was raised that should have raised uh, a lot of concern at that point of time that we have here something new. It's not uh, 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 like the old SARS. It is a different one. It's more virulent and more fit to uh, jump from one person to the other. Now, if you look and that led to more research, and now we know that in fact, once uh, in, uh, uh, the virus goes through the nose and the number of virus particles in the nose start to increase with time and for some time to increase and then reach a level, some level, and when that level it will go to the throat, into the lung, and there where you start the disease and the infection really becomes more uh, virulent and the disease starts. And as you can see here, the virus in the nose goes down when you are really very sick. And therefore, this part is what we call some asymptomatic people, asymptomatic people that have the, the virus in their nose, but they are not sick and therefore and the ability of this virus to jump from one person to the other is really uh, very dangerous and therefore uh, uh, tackling the problem of the colonization in the nose is very important to prevent the spread of the disease and which is a major risk factor for people. And what we've seen also that uh, it's very infectious and the people at risk at this point of time uh, was the nursing homes, older people, people with some uh, predisposition like uh, inf uh, heart disease, diabetes, and uh, 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 immune, immune system, uh, weak immune system. Those people are at risk and those people should be uh, taken care of, including the people who are taking care of these patients, including the uh, uh, healthcare uh, takers uh, like doctors, nurses, and nursing home uh, personnel. Those are the people that are at high risk uh, in, uh, for infection. Now, if you look at the uh, chronology of the disease now, is that and the first is e when person is exposed uh, through the nose, you have virus growing in the nose for three to five days. And when it reaches the high level, it starts going down into the throat and into the lungs and the infection started. Now it becomes symptomatic. Now this period, the yellow period here is very important to prevent, very important to treat and prevent uh, progression of the disease. And if the disease progress, there are two options. One option is that cause fatality, which is ranges between 0.8 to 10%. But it depends on the testing and so forth. But we believe it's about 1.5%, which is about 10 times more than the flu. And the recovery. So either of you recover or you are uh, 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 succumb to, to the infection and, 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 and die. So therefore, all these, this is the chronology. And therefore, that would define for us where we are intervening. And uh, the, uh, the, what we call uh, the fatality is coming because uh, the cells, the immune system, when it starts to uh, fight the infection, they produce a lot of cytokines, enzymes, and hormones, and so forth. And that would be, make like a storm. That storm is really what take yourself into the fever and all these uh, issues with the, with the symptoms. And some people, uh, if the storm is strong, you cannot uh, uh, deal with it you get all the uh, organs, fa organ failures, and there that will bring to, the, to, the, uh, to death or, fat or, or uh, uh, fatality. Or if you are able to protect, uh, to uh, stand this storm, you can recover. 
Now, some of the interventions are really in the area here where we can uh, reduce the intensity of the storm so that the immune system and the body can overcome the storm. So what kind of interventions we have? There are the uh, preventive transmission, that's one important thing, which is the social uh, uh, distancing, hand washing, hand sanitization, mask wearing, because now we know it's in the nose, you have to cover your nose and your mouth so you cannot really transmit the virus from one person to the other. And also now we, uh, uh, there is no nose sanitization that we can uh, help in killing the virus, killing bacteria in the nose and so forth. That should be helping. The other part is the intervention, the treatment. Once somebody is sick, you need to treat. And I'm not gonna go into the details for this presentation. There is the antivirals, remdesivir. There are uh, 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 repurposing some of the drugs like the famous hydroxychloroquine and also the antiprotease and so forth. All these uh, uh, interventions are in the going and these are drugs being developed. The major approach is really to protect with a vaccine. Vaccine is the best thing that can happen to human, uh, that happen to human race, is production of a vaccine that can prevent in, uh, the virus uh, from the uh, infection. And also the best thing is if you are preventing colonization and the transmission. So uh, what is the ideal vaccine? Well, you know, if you don't have a vaccine, what kind of vaccine you really you are gonna look for? You can look, you have to look for a safe vaccine because you are giving it to healthy people to prevent disease. So therefore it should be safe. It should be, it should induce uh, virus neutralizing antibodies. And we're already hearing about the antibodies. Uh, because those antibodies, and I'll show in, 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 in a second slide how this works, it prevent infection. And then you need T cell mediated immunity. You need, you need to kill the cells that are infected so they are not gonna provide more and more virus. And that needs cell to cell interaction and killing by immune cells. And I think that one of the important thing is to prevent the spread and pandemic and epidemic, you need to induce mucosal immunity in your nose and your lungs. So even if the virus gets to the nose, you will not be able to colonize and propagate. And if it gets to the lungs, you can really prevent it from attaching to the cells in the lungs and prevent the infection. So that's very important part that uh, I'll, I'll be focusing on uh, going on, side, on, on forward. So if you look at the antibodies, if you have antibodies, the virus that gets out of the cell now is bound to the antibodies. So the, anti, the, the spike protein where it binds to the cells is covered with antibody and therefore the virus cannot bind to the receptors on the cells. That's one mechanism. The second mechanism you need to have, <coughs> you need to have uh, the uh, T cell mediated immunity, which is the immune cells that they look and look around and see which cell is infected and they kill it and engulf it and they clear it out so the virus cannot propagate. So these are the two mechanisms that are working on how to prevent the infection in those cells. Now, we know that from CHIMP work that uh, infection with the virus uh, and recovery can induce immunity that the, the animals will not be, get infected again. And here is a, uh, a study showing that chimps, uh, chimpanzees were uh, infected, allowed to recover, and then they challenged them again. And all uh, chimps were uh, protected. And that's a great, uh, a great thing because that tells us that infection and, and, and immunity can be induced against this virus. That's a major uh, 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 thing to have. And which antibody you are looking for, which immunity? The major thing is this part, which we call a receptor binding domain. On the, on the crown here, there's area which comes with the, the first step of the infection. If you are able to have immunity against that, then you are able to prevent the virus from uh, sticking to the cells and preventing from infection. So almost every uh, vaccine that is out there is focused on this area of the spike protein or the crown that we have on the virus. Almost 100 or more than 100 
companies, they are targeting this area. So we know where we're going with this vaccine and what would be our target. And if you look, what are the vaccines out there? What are the, the technologies approach? There are several ones. Now, uh, you have the famous ones now, the RNA vaccine, that is really the, uh, uh, the uh, sweetheart for almost everybody, including the White House, is the RNA vaccine and the DNA vaccine. Where you take your RNA, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, materials, and you synthesize it outside, this is the RNA on which the, DNA, the, the protein will be uh, translated. So you inject it to the cells, the cells take it and start to translate it into proteins. So those are the proteins. So your body is producing the proteins, which are the, uh, uh, the vaccine candidate. And then it will process it as a vaccine and generate an immune response. The other part is viral vectors. Instead of giving the uh, coronavirus, you take a virus which is not infectious and you put that, allow that virus to put the corona spike protein on it. So you are really uh, giving a non-virulent uh, uh, virus that will introduce the, uh, the, the spike protein. So you are, there are different vari variation of that technologies. Uh, like a uh, replicating and everybody has his own virus that will, produce, that will introduce the, uh, the, the vaccine. The classical way that we use is just to go and say, okay, you know what, I'll take that, uh, that part of the protein, I'll propagate it and produce it outside in human cells or in animal cells, and then I'll purify it and I'll give it as a vaccine, which is like we do the pertosis, like the, uh, the other uh, uh, vaccines, it's a protein. So, and this is the classical way, it's subunit, and there are some uh, vaccines in the clinical trial right, that, right now. I think you all heard probably about Novavax. They have a protein here, and whether it's a, uh, a free protein or a subunit or a VLP or virus-like particles and so forth. So if you look at these three categories, you can see that we are really approaching it in different ways. Now, the RNA and the DNA, which is really, as I said, is the sweetheart of everybody now these days, um, those are non-proven uh, technologies. There is no DNA or RNA vaccine so far. RNA is the vaccine has been out for many years, and there is no vaccine that beyond phase one clinical trials, and even Moderna, who is really having all the fame these days, they never pass the phase one clinical trials. They never publish data that support that this uh, technology might have a great uh, 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 promise. Anyway, I'll get to that in the data later on onto this. So that's really uh, some concerns here. The, for the viral vectors, the, again, the same thing. They can produce the virus. There is some phase one, phase two, but there is no proven uh, uh, vaccine that already licensed for here. For these classical ways, almost we have uh, uh, every vaccine that we have is part of this. So if you look at all these categories, you can see how many vaccine companies you have about uh, 25 uh, plus uh, in viral vaccines, about 40 co companies. Uh, nucleic acids, protein-based, you have about 60, and other, uh, uh, other vaccine technology. So we are really attacking it from different uh, 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 direction. Now, as for developing a vaccine, is a process. That process, as Khalil indicated in his introduction, it can take five to 10 years. Five to 10 years, that's a, uh, assuming that you have a success. If now many of these vaccines can reach phase one, phase two, and phase three clinical trial and fail in the phase three. So the, the, the process goes for phase one, which is safety and immunogenicity. Phase two, you are applying it to specific population. You look what is the dose that you are going to use, what's the schedule, and then you go to phase three. Usually in phase two, you get a hint whether you are in the right direction or not. But even if you have a hint in phase two, sometimes phase three is failure. So the if success rate in no, under normal conditions is no more than 10%. So out of 10 uh, vaccine candidate, maybe one or two will be successful. 
Now, what under the uh, circumstances of the pandemic, we are talking about condensing this 10 years into what? Nine, according to the White House, it's 10, 10 months, uh, 10, uh, one year or 12 months. According to uh, other uh, optimistic people, 18 to 24 months. So basically, they want to take 10 years and you put it down into two years. That's, I'm, I'm take the, the a more conservative two, two years. And that would require GMP manufacturing, which is a very complicated process. Phase one, two, three clinical trials for safety, for immunogenicity, for functionality, and for efficacy. And then you have the licensor, licensure. Then you have a large scale manufacturing for millions and hundreds of millions of people. Then you need to find a way to administer it. And syringes are a huge problem environmentally and also for public health until you get the immunity. So all of this is gonna happen in 18 months instead of five years. Now, is it doable? Possible. Now let's, we'll look at that later on uh, uh, regarding where we at and what are the, uh, um, the issues with going this kind of, of, of progress. Remember that major thing for the FDA is safety. And I believe that the FDA and EMA will not allow a vaccine to go forward without having enough safety data. That's, if there is any political uh, push, they, I'm sure the FDA will push back. And you are counting on science really to make sure that uh, this condensation of the timelines is not gonna affect the efficacy or the uh, safety of these vaccines. Now, <clears throat> what are the concerns of all of this picture? The concern that we have here is that the RNA and DNA vaccines, there is no proof for successful track record. More than 20 years, always in phase one, we never got to phase two, phase three. There are no peer-reviewed publication. This is the basic thing. In order to be able to say, yes, we have it, you have to have a uh, peer-reviewed publication about your technology, your data. There is nothing like that. Safety. Uh, what is the safety of these vaccines, of these technologies? What is the quality of the antibodies that, and the immunity that we are getting? What is the longevity? How long are we going to have this immunity with us? There is a poor efficacy. Another concern, which is a major in my case, is that poor efficacy of IM vaccine against respiratory infections. We don't have a successful track record with the inf respiratory infection. Look at the RSV. It's with us until today, we don't have a vaccine for RSV. It's a respiratory syncytial virus that causes in asthma in kids. CMV, uh, 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 SARS, and we have a vaccine for flu and we have a vaccine for pneumococcus. Now, when we're gonna look into the uh, efficacy of the flu vaccine. Now, flu vaccine, we all get flu vaccine. Now, if you look at the efficacy of the vaccine for the last 19 years, it ranges between 19% and 60%, and actually we crossed the 50% only twice or three times. So basically we have a great vaccine that we all take it. It's a, even the best case scenario are at 50% efficacy. Are we going to apply this to the vaccine that we are developing now, right now for SARS that will be uh, uh, satisfied with 50% efficacy. I don't know where these guys are going uh, with this. So we have issues with respiratory infection and efficacy of vaccines, even with the best vaccine that we have uh, uh, today. So this is where our technology from the University of Michigan and Blue Willow is coming into, into, the, into the game. What we are saying is that these respiratory infections have to have mucosal and local immunity in addition to the immunity in the blood. So the virus gets in, you have a first line of defense in the nose and in the lungs that the virus cannot cross. And if, and if some will cross, then the systemic immunity will take care of it. So those are creating a first line of defense by immunizing in the nose, creating immunity in the nose and in the lungs that will uh, 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 tackle these infections. And we think that this is a major component of that. So the technology that we have from the University of Michigan is a nano emulsion, nanotechnology 
that can have uh, that has a antimicrobial activity which means if you take this technology and you mix it with the virus it will kill a virus mix it with a bacteria it will kill a bacteria and this is where we had introduced what we call nanobioprotect it's a uh, last week it's been launched is an intranasal or antiseptic for na with nasal swabs. So you just put it in the nose. And also we have another property that this technology with some variation can be used as, an, as a delivery system of a vaccine into the nose to induce mucosal immunity uh, in addition to the systemic immunity. And I'll give you an example for uh, uh, RSV vaccine and the flu vaccines in ferrets and in non-human primates, and showing you that if you induce mucosal immunity in the nose and in the lungs, you can prevent colonization, you can prevent infection, compared to the IM where there is breakthroughs, you are not always being able to protect. So we took uh, uh, RSV vaccines in, and, and immunized animals in the nose or in the injectable, like the other vaccines and everybody is, is taking, adjuvant with adjuvant. And we look at the nasal wash. After we give the, the animals uh, the challenge, we immunize them three times, and then we give them uh, a challenge in the nose and in the lungs. And we look, is the virus killed? Is the virus propagating there? And what is going on? Here you see uh, on, on the uh, uh, yellow here, orange, you see the animals that receive the vaccine intramuscularly. And here is the vaccine, the uh, red one is the vaccine received intranasally. And you can see after seven days, the vaccine, the vaccine in the no uh, the virus in the nose is gone. There is no virus in the nose while all animals in the IM vaccinated animals they still have virus in the nose. So that tells us that the uh, intranasal immunization is giving you protection based on it, uh, be making uh, a first line and second line of defense, while IM immunization is giving you only the one line of defense, which is the line two. And if you look at the lungs, <coughs> the same story in the lungs. So the lungs, you can clear with intranasal, with the mucosal immunity, you cannot, did not clear it with the intramuscular immunization. You can prevent disease, but you cannot prevent the, the colonization and the shedding and the spread and transmission. And that's an important part with the, uh, with the virus, with the uh, uh, respiratory viruses. And the same thing here with the, uh, with the uh, uh, flu. This is pandemic flu. And you can see animals that receive intranasal immunization. There is no virus in their nose. You give them a, a colossal amount of virus in the nose, and then you look for it. If you are not, inf if you are infected, if you are a placebo, non-immunized animals, you have virus in the nose for five days. From day one, you are not, uh, you are clearing the virus in the in the nose. In in your case, I'm sorry, I'm trying to finish it. Now, if you look at the, this data, which is, came from the Oxford vaccine, you know, we all heard that Oxford is going into phase two and planning a phase three. This is a chimpanzee's work with the, their vaccine. They were given intramuscular and the animals were challenged. If you look at the nasal colonization, the blue ones are the animals that were not immunized. The red are the animals that were immunized. And you can see that you did not impact the virus in the nose. And therefore, you are really, whether you immunize or not, you are going to carry it and give it around. If you look at the lungs, you have the animals, two of the three animals uh, uh, still have in the uh, non-immunized animals. They have the virus in their lungs, and they, two out of four animals, two out of six animals from the immunized animals, they still have virus in the lungs. So you did not get, you get no protection in the nose, you get partial protection against the virus in the lungs. And of course, you know, the, there was no in, uh, pathology in the lungs, meaning the virus, the vaccine worked in preventing pathology in the lungs, but the virus is still there, the virus is still in the nose, and therefore the, the expectation that you are gonna get uh, from this, uh, this vaccine should be really put in the main, in the same, uh, 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 you know, 
we'll take it with, with a grain of salt. Don't be that optimistic, don't be that uh, pessimistic about it. There is a chance, but the that chance probably, and what I think it's, it's gonna be no more than what we've seen with the flu vaccine efficacy. Now we come to the uh, great news from a uh, couple of days ago with Moderna. Moderna had a phase one clinical trial with their RNA vaccine and they had 45 people uh, in this study. They presented data from eight people. So all this noise is coming from eight people from this study that they presented. And they showed that it's, it's a neutralizing antibodies. They all responded with neutralizing antibodies. There are many questions and many concerns and no answers from Moderna, from anybody. First is that what about the rest of the volunteers? You have 45. And this is the first time ever that somebody who's running a clinical trial reporting data from eight out of 45 patients and having this bombastic news about it and no answers. You know, why eight out of 45? You should finish your clinical trial and then report it. Anyway, neutralizing antibody on day 43, two, uh, about uh, 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 two weeks after the second immunization. Is that enough? What is happening at three months or at six months? Where are we at with all of this? Where is, what levels? You know, they say, okay, this is, we generated antibodies similar to what happened with convalescing people, people who recover from the disease. If you look at the, the, the people who recover from the disease, the antibody and neutralizing activity range between zero and high levels. So where is your number sits on this spectrum? Are they close to the zero or are they close to the highest numbers? So there are no numbers there, just this is statement like that. And that's not really scientific. That's not really what you expect from a company with the $29 billion uh, capital. Uh, so um, then do we have, why, why we are rushing? Why we are rushing for just going out with eight people? What happened to the people with the high dose? You know, is the safety issues there? What are the safeties? And then this, this vaccine was produced and run by the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, headed by Dr. Tony Fauci. And if you look at the history of Tony for the last uh, uh, 30 years, every time that there is a breakthrough, Tony is on top of everything and he goes out with a statement. And the vaccine was made there, evaluated by the NIAID, and the NIAID is silent, silent, silent. So where, where are you guys? You know, what, where do you stand? And that's really, all these are questions about this technology, and this is the leading vaccine that had received uh, a colossal amount of money from the public and from the, the government. And I think that we are, uh, uh, it's a legitimate to, uh, to raise those issues when it comes to that, because it was uh, out, of, out of the uh, uh, ordinary uh, way of doing this. And uh, finally, this is what we are planning, to, uh, our, our plans is to take the spike protein and, and have it formulated with the uh, nano emulsion, the nanovax, and create an intranasal vaccine and uh, go into the, uh, and, and take it to the uh, intranasal vaccine and to prevent uh, colonization, our target, prevent colonization and shedding and transmission in addition to preventing the disease. We are in the preclinical uh, stage uh, and we are a small company. So uh, the money, all the money went to the uh, all big ones, but we are really uh, uh, hoping that this kind will take track and then we uh, uh, get into somewhere with this, with this vaccine. And, uh, I think I, by the, uh, by, uh, when I, I would like to really to acknowledge my colleagues, uh, Vera Betko, Tarek Hamouda, Doug Smith, Shamala Gansen, Susan Ciotti, Blue Willow Research Team, and a vaccine research group at the University of Michigan. Go Blue. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fatoum. I appreciate that. Uh, you gave us a lot of information to uh, uh, think about. Let's uh, dive directly into the Q&A session. We have uh, several questions that came in already. The first one came from Mohammed Shinawi uh, from the Voice of America. Uh, Pfizer Pharmaceutical 
combine two stages, uh, referring back to, I guess, the slide you presented, uh, two stages of testing a new vaccine promising to be ready by the end of the year. Is that feasible? No. Oh. It, it's, it's a big no, because remember, first of all, <coughs> There are two, two aspects here. One is that technology is not proven. We don't have a vaccine, RNA vaccine, that even in phase two clinical trial. So to assume that you will have it from the first shot, that's really too much. Se secondly, Pfizer knows that to develop a vaccine, and they are a great vaccinologist at Pfizer. <clears throat> to develop a vaccine, it will take five to 10 years. And actually, they have been working for more, more than 15 years on the staphylococcus vaccine. They know it's not easy. Th secondly, uh, is, is that the immune response, we don't know what kind of immune response you are generating. We don't know how long. <clears throat> so therefore, it's very hard to believe that even if you go for phase two right away, are you gonna get efficacy? Okay, what kind of efficacy you are targeting? Is 50% efficacy is enough? Uh, what kind of safety database? Can you bring a 5,000 safety? Uh, <clears throat> I believe that the FDA would require at least 2,500 uh, uh, safety database for patients. So basically, I think that uh, it's too much, it's too early, and uh, I don't believe any process, biological process, will, will take less than 18 to 24 months. Uh, the next question came from uh, Saeed Arikat from uh, Al-Quds uh, newspaper. It says, even if a vaccine is developed uh, by early next year, is it realistic to expect that this vaccine will be effective uh, before uh, summer of 2021, uh, particularly in terms of making it available to the whole world uh, and uh, recruit a huge army of, of uh, staff uh, to vaccinate uh, people? Besides, you get the issue of the cost. Uh, who will pay uh, for 7.5 billion uh, vaccinations? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, uh, I, I think that there is a chance if everything goes well, there is no hiccups and uh, we are lucky. Uh, and uh, there is, would be a vaccine, an indication that the vaccine works by, the, uh, by next summer. <clears throat> number one. So in the next season, uh, uh, probably we will not have it, but we may. Now, as for the uh, as for the uh, distribution and uh, and and availability to other people, <clears throat> I think for the first time we are seeing here the combination of governments and uh, a private uh, or uh, non-profit organizations and funding. So, um, and I think also that the WHO is a major player in this because it is the link between the first world and the rest of the world. And therefore manufacturing is, uh, is gonna be happening. Uh, the WHO needs to be, take uh, its role uh, uh, in, in mediating and, and, and getting the technology into the right place. Uh, the third world usually uh, don't pay that much for vaccines because the WHO makes sure that the manufacturers, uh, it's manufactured in different places so that it will cost less than a dollar per, per dose. And therefore, I would think that uh, we are not going to have the, state, the whole world vaccinated by end of next year, but definitely we'll, have, we'll see if we have a successful vaccine, we will see that it will be a... a, a you know, available for uh, many people, let's put it this way, especially that, uh, that one of the consideration for the RNA vaccines and DNA vaccines uh, is that it can be produced in large amount fast. And as we say in Arabic, the devil is always there. And therefore you cannot expect that uh, 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 yeah, a combination, it's really, look, it's really a, a very um, a magic mix, fast manufacturing, fast clinical trial, fast, 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 and you expect to have success when you had five years, in many cases, that did not uh, uh, yield any success. So I will take it uh, a little bit with, with patience and with some uh, reservation. Uh, Dr. Fatoum, is it possible to get infected again with COVID-19 once you have had it before? Or is the data, as you alluded to it earlier, is still too small to make that determination? 
it's too small today to make that uh, determination, but the, uh, at least uh, from what we know about viral infections, what we know from uh, 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 other experiences, is that usually if you are infected and you mount a good immune response, you are protected for life. Now, uh, many people are, who are recovered might not have um, immunity because they are sick. So basically, it's not kind of a healthy, quote unquote, recovery where your immune system is activated and then recover from that, then you have all the memory, uh, immune memory uh, available. So basically, it could be that uh, some of the people will not have it. But uh, if you are healthy and you get infected, it is most probably for a, 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 good, a good chance that you will be protected from a second uh, uh, infection. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> uh, will this disease remain with us? Uh, another emailed question. Uh, with us like the flu. And uh, will, we know, will we now have to take a yearly uh, COVID-19 shot like the flu shot? Well, that's a good question. Uh, and uh, in Arabic, we say, <laughs> but, uh, uh, I, You cannot predict, uh, you know, what is going to happen. But uh, at least uh, what we think is that this virus behavior is similar to, similar to what uh, the flu vaccine, flu uh, uh, behaves. So the behavior is very similar. Therefore, we would expect that we'll have the waves and you will have the seasonability, uh, uh, seasonality of the of the infection, and it could be that it's gonna it's here to stay because it's so fit that uh, uh, this this virus and so resembling the the characteristics of the infection with the with the flu and RSV, and therefore it's not gonna be uh, uh, something that will be here uh, and will disappear in a year or two. Number two is that uh, with regards to weekly, uh, um, uh, yearly vaccination, the flu changes very fast. And therefore we have a yearly injection uh, a vaccine because the virus it changes. Now the difference between this virus and the flu virus is that the amount of, uh, of the RNA uh, in this virus is about twice the amount that the flu has, which means this virus has enough uh, uh, enzymes and enough protein that can correct the uh, translation and, the pro and, and transcription. So basically, if something happened to the RNA, there is enough tools for this virus to correct it. It's like you have autocorrect when you write. So the, the, the possibility to have some mutation that will translate into uh, loss of immune, immune, immunity and loss of uh, specificity that really uh, goes a little bit below compared to the flu. To the flu. So therefore, uh, the virus is steady, is fit, uh, it can correct itself so the changes are not happening fast like the flu. So therefore, we could be lucky and the virus will not change and we can have uh, an, a vaccine that will cover any possible emergence of any variation, which is gonna be minor. All right, we have still uh, quite a few questions. If you don't mind uh, giving some brief answers to the following to try to accommodate as many as uh, possible before our time uh, is up. Uh, how do you explain the discrepancy between the high rate of infections of COVID-19, uh, but uh, a lower rate uh, who end up developing severe symptoms? Well, it seems that uh, it's like the flu, you know, we, the, it's a, you get, if you have a good immune response, immune system, and you are able to respond to the virus, you would be able to, to, to overcome that. Now, uh, elderly, uh, you know, when you get older, uh, you, uh, you, your immune system become, uh, uh, or you're suffering from uh, 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 immunosenescence, meaning that your immune system is also getting old. Therefore, the immune response would be weaker. And therefore, with age, you are become more susceptible to infections. Your immune system is not as strong. And therefore, you are more 
uh, uh, prone for infections and for uh, 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 progressing to, to, uh, to disease. When you're young, you have a very good immune response and therefore you are able to mount a good uh, protective immune response, good memory, and therefore you could uh, uh, survive that. So as you can see, about 50% of the, of the fatalities were in the nursing homes and many of the others were really because of collapse of, uh, uh, of, of internal organs and also having predisposition uh, or predisposed to, to the infection like heart disease, uh, um, diabetes and other chronic diseases. So that's really makes a big difference. Uh, is Moderna RNA vaccine based on one or more strains of the COVID-19 virus? There's no more, there is one COVID-19 virus uh, and the, the RBD or the uh, uh, receptor binding domain is the same. So we are not uh, talking about different viruses like the flu. We are talking about the same virus. And therefore the RNA, their RNA is one RNA there uh, that they have, which is uh, related to the R uh, RBD, the receptor binding protein. And I think they have also some other areas of the spike protein integrated there. So basically, uh, it's really, uh, it's universal for all, for all the COVID-19 uh, virus. Uh, Sophie Brahim uh, would like to know, do we know the infectious dose of the virus? No, but if you look at the no, in, in nasal carriage or nasal colonization, you say, what, what is the maximum we reach? We reach a maximum of 12, 10 to the 5 PFUs or plaque forming unit, which means that uh, uh, it, it, there is no specific uh, infectious dose because they, we've they never done it. Uh, if you look at the animals for the chimpanzees, for instance, they were ch uh, challenged with 10 to the 5 PFUs, 10 to the, 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 PFUs. Uh, PFUs is plaque forming unit, number of particles, about a million particle uh, can cause the infection in the animal. Now, it's very hard to interpret from, uh, uh, extrapolate the data from the chimp to humans, because animals, they always lie. So don't believe them always. Uh, the last question will be from Dr. Suleiman Abu Badr, uh, who thanks you uh, for uh, this very informative uh, presentation and would like to know, uh, why do you think the percentage of COVID-19 uh, deaths in the Arab world and perhaps in, in other countries are much lower than, for example, here uh, in the U.S.? Is, it, is that biological uh, or what, what other differences factor in here? Well, I, I don't have uh, nobody really is able to answer that question because uh, if you look at, at uh, Africa for instance and India <coughs> they all have hydroxychloroquine uh, for malaria and so forth so they're like like a daily uh, 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 treatment and in the Arab world you know maybe we are lucky for one time, one, one time <laughs> that we are lucky and uh, um, but I don't think that there is a, uh, a genetic issue, but this is something that people need to be researched. And I think it's uh, uh, prone to, uh, for researchers in the Arab world to go out and uh, test it and check it, because that's what happened also inside Arab uh, Palestine, uh, that the, the numbers are low, and the numbers actually came because infection in the Israeli side that were transmitted to the Palestinian side. So basically, uh, uh, that's an area to be discussed and to be evaluated. And I think maybe some people uh, have started that because if you look at the infection, for instance, inside Israel, you can see that most of the infection happened in the Ashkenazi area. So uh, not the Sephardic. So is there something uh, genetic uh, uh, background? Is there uh, uh, other factors? I have no idea, but need to be researched. Yeah, I've, I've noticed a couple of people trying to refer to also the age distribution in certain societies, including Arab society, where 65 plus percent are under the age of 25 as a potential uh, factor, uh, since the, the COVID-19 doesn't hit younger uh, mm -hmm. people as much. Uh, but at any rate, uh, Dr. Fatoum, thank you so much uh, for joining us today, for the great information that you have uh, shared with us.
and ladies and gentlemen who attended this uh, webinar, thank you again for joining us, and we hope that you would do that again uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Khalil.